Hello, and welcome to General Astronomy Lecture 4, Making Sense of the Universe. In this lecture, we will continue our history lesson that we left off from last time, and we'll bring ourselves finally up to speed in modern terms of astronomy. Um, so this will be our last history lesson uh, before we get into the core material of the course. So, uh, from last time we mentioned a few people in particular, and we left off with Tycho. Uh, Tycho failed to explain the motions of planets satisfactorily, but he did succeed in finding someone who could. In 1600, he hired the young German astronomer Johannes Kepler. In 1601, as he lay on his deathbed, Tycho begged Kepler to find a system that would make sense of his observations, so that, quote, uh, it may not appear I have lived in vain. Kepler was deeply religious and believed that uh, understanding the geometry of the heavens would bring him closer to God. Like Copernicus, he believed that planetary orbits should be perfect circles, so he worked diligently to match circular motions to Tycho's data. He attempted to find a unified model with circular orbits. In doing so, he found that some of his predictions differed from Tycho's observations by as much as uh, eight arc minutes. Kepler surely was tempted to ignore these discrepancies and attribute them to errors by Tycho. After all, eight arc minutes is barely one-fourth the angular diameter of the full moon. But Kepler trusted Tycho's work carefully. The small discrepancies finally led Kepler to abandon the idea of circular orbits and to find the correct solution to the ancient riddle of planetary motion. About this event, Kepler wrote... If I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes of arc, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But, since it was not permissible to ignore, those eight minutes pointed the, uh, pointed the road to a complete reform in astronomy. So this gives you a sense of how important this was. We're finally breaking away from the idea of heavenly perfection in circular orbits. So, as we now know today, orbits are elliptical. Astronomers had long assumed that heavenly objects moved in circles, which were considered the most perfect and uh, harmonious of all geometric shapes. They believed that if a perfect god resided in heaven along with the stars and planets, then the motions of these objects must also be perfect too. Against this context, Kepler dared to try to explain planetary motions with non-circular curves. In particular, he found that he had the best success with a particular kind of curve that we call an ellipse. You can draw a circle by putting a pencil on the end of a string, tacking the string to a board, and pulling the pencil around. Drawing an ellipse is similar, except you must stretch the string around two tacks. The locations of the two tacks are what we call foci, or the singular version as a focus, uh, of the ellipse. So this is actually really fascinating, and this is something I do in my face-to-face -face course. We actually draw these ellipses. It's very simple. Um, you literally just put two tacks in a piece of cardboard with some string around it and then move your pencil around it. Um, and you can form a perfect ellipse every time. And you can vary the size of the ellipse based on where your foci are. The long axis of the ellipse is called its major axis, each half of which is called the semi-major axis. So you can see that there on the figure on the right. Very important terms, we'll use them quite a bit. Um, the, the short axis is called the minor axis. By altering the distance between the two foci while keeping the length of the string the same, you can draw ellipses of varying eccentricity given by the letter lowercase e, a quantity that describes how much an ellipse is stretched out compared to a perfect circle. And for reference, a circle is an ellipse with zero eccentricity, so you see that on the left in the bottom figure, and a greater eccentricity means a more elongated ellipse, going all the way to E equals 1 for what would look like a vertical line. So a perfect circle has no eccentricity, 0, and the most eccentric or the most elliptical uh, shapes have an eccentricity of about 1. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how we can quantify these sort of things. So let's have a quick concept check. Which orbit is most uh, close to being circular? Venus's orbit with an eccentricity of 0 0.007 or the orbit of Mars with an eccentricity of 0 
Take a moment to think about that, pause the video if you need, and we'll come back in a moment. All right, well, an ellipse with an eccentricity of zero is a perfect circle. Since Venus has the smaller eccentricity, that means its orbit is more circular, and so uh, the answer in this case would be Venus's orbit. It has the lower eccentricity, so it's closer to that of a circle. All right. Well, Kepler did a lot of very important things. So he did move away from circular orbits, but he did a lot more than that, and he was able to quantify much of what happened. So he summarized his discoveries with three simple laws that we now call Kepler's laws of planetary motion. He published the first of two laws in 1609 and the third in 1619. Kepler's first law tells us that the orbit of each planet around the Sun is an ellipse, with the Sun at one focus and technically nothing at the other. So this is his first law, the idea that orbits are elliptical. In essence, this law tells us that a planet's distance from the Sun varies during its orbit. It is closest at the point called perihelion, from the Greek word for near the Sun, and it is farthest away from the Sun at a point called aphelion, for the Greek word away from the Sun. The average of a planet's perihelion and aphelion distances is the length of its semi-major axis. So that's pretty important, right? So the average distance is that semi-major axis. This brings us to Kepler's second law. Kepler's second law states that as a planet moves around its orbit, it sweeps out equal areas in equal times. That is, the planet travels faster when it is near to the Sun and slower when it is far away from the Sun. So to summarize, it says that this means that a planet moves a greater distance when it is near perihelion than, when it, is, than it does in the same amount of time near aphelion. So you can see this, no matter what amount of time you choose, the planet will always sweep out an equal amount of area. So for example, when it's at uh, perihelion, it has to move much faster than when it is way out here at aphelion and moving more slowly. So the area that it sweeps out, these little highlighted regions, they're always equal. This area here is equal to the area from A to B. And that will always be the case uh, as long as we understand physics. So that is the second law. So not only do we know they move in ellipses now, but we know that the speed varies as you move around the orbit. And then we come to Kepler's third law. This is the only one with some mathematical uh, construct that we'll show. Um, but Kepler's third law tells us that the more distant planets orbit the Sun at slower averaging speeds, obeying a precise mathematical relationship, which is written as p squared equals a cubed. This is kind of the simple version of it. There's a much larger version that includes some of Newton's laws later on, um, but we don't need to go into it that much. So what is this equation showing us? This is our first equation in the class, um, so it's good to discuss it a little bit more um, than we have. Well here p is equal to the planet's orbital period in years. So that's how long it takes to orbit the Sun, in, uh, and we measure that in units of years. Uh, a is the average distance from the Sun in astronomical units. So this could be uh, considered the semi-major axis, A. Um, so this is measured in those astronomical units, which if you recall from uh, previous lectures, an astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So uh, the figure uh, shows the P squared equals A cubed law graphically. Notice that the square of each planet's orbital period is equal to the cube of its average distance. So this is showing you here on the top graph that the orbital period squared, p squared, as in our equation, is equal to the average distance cubed. So you see that you have a direct relationship. It's a straight line. So for every, every time you increase the orbital period squared, you increase the average distance cubed by a linear fashion. And here it plots each planet along this line. So all of the planets lie along the same line on this graph. So it's telling us that they, those two quantities are equal. 
Uh, because Kepler's third law relates a planet's orbital distance and its orbital time, or the period, we can use the law to calculate a planet's average orbital speed. So this is what the second figure shows here on the bottom. It shows that, it shows that result, confirming that more distant planets orbit the sun more slowly. So this is not a linear graph, so sometimes it can be more confusing for people. But here we're plotting average orbital speed, how fast it's moving, compared to the distance away from the sun. And notice that as you go from a distance of 1 AU, where the Earth is, all the way out to Saturn at 9.5 AU, the speed is decreasing as you move outward. You see that? So as you, move, as you start from Mercury near the Sun, you're moving really fast. But as you move further and further out, planets are moving more slowly. So this is a great graphical relationship uh, thanks to Kepler's laws. So let's try a couple more questions. First, the space shuttle typically orbits, uh, orbited the Earth at an altitude of 300 kilometers, whereas the International Space Station orbits the Earth at an altitude of 450 kilometers. Although the speed, uh, I'm sorry, although the space shuttle took less time to orbit the Earth, which one moved at a faster speed? So take a moment to think about that, pause your video, and come back when you're ready. Okay. According to Kepler's third law, planets closer to the Sun move faster than planets farther from the Sun. This is the same for objects orbiting the Earth, or any other body. Thus, the space shuttle moved faster because it was more near the Earth. Just like, for example, Mercury moves faster than Saturn, because it's more near the Sun. So in the same way, these laws apply. And this is a great thing about physics, is it applies everywhere in the universe, as far as we know. Um, unless we have parallel universes, so far we know that physics works everywhere. Okay, we haven't done any math yet, so let's test out your mathematical abilities with this little equation that we've introduced. If Pluto's orbit has a semi-major axis of 39.5 astronomical units, how long does it take Pluto to orbit the Sun once? So use that equation we've introduced, and pause your video, and return when you're ready. Alright, well, we need to use p squared equals a cubed. We are given the semi-major axis a, so we can plug that into our equation for a. We take that number, we cube it, and then we have to take the square root of whatever that is to get p. Because right now p, the period, is squared, but we need the period alone, not the period squared. So once you get your value, take the square root, and you should find that you get roughly 250 years. So it takes Pluto about 250 Earth years to orbit the Sun just once, where it takes us one year. Alright, well, the success of Kepler's laws in matching Tycho's data provided strong evidence in, fa in favor of Copernicus's placement of the Sun rather than the Earth at the center of the solar system. Nevertheless, many scientists still voiced reasonable objections to the Copernican view. There were three basic objections, all rooted in the 2,000-year-old belief of Aristotle and other ancient Greeks. First, Aristotle had held that Earth could not be moving because if it were moving, objects such as birds, falling stones, and clouds would be left behind as Earth moved along its way. So it sounds a bit ridiculous, but if you really think about that, it's not too crazy. I mean, I, I just came up with this example on the spot, but think of holding like maybe a baseball and a leaf on top of the baseball. As you throw the baseball, the leaf falls off, right? Because the ball was moving, the leaf falls off. But, you know, so they took that idea and kind of thought that things would fall off the earth if it were moving. Not unreasonable at the time. Second, the idea of non-circular orbits contradicted Aristotle's claim that the heavens, the realm of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, must be perfect and unchanging. And third, no one had detected the stellar parallax that should occur if Earth orbits the sun. So if you recall, in previous lectures we talked about parallax, and remember that parallax is the apparent motion of an object, not because that object is actually moving, but because the observer is moving. So you can refer back to that if you need. So Galileo Galilei, usually known by his first name, answered all three of these objections.
So let's get into his story. Galileo diffused the first objection with experiments that almost single-handedly overturned the Aristotelian view of physics. In particular, he used experiments with rolling balls to demonstrate that a moving object will remain in motion unless a force acts to stop it. This is an idea now confided in Newton's first law of motion, which we'll talk about very soon. This insight explained why objects that share Earth's motion through space, such as birds falling stones and clouds, should stay with Earth rather than falling behind, as Aristotle had argued. This same idea explains why passengers with a, mo uh, with a moving airplane... I'm sorry, that's, this idea also explains why passengers stay with a moving airplane even when they leave their seats. The second objection had already been challenged by Tycho's supernova and comet observations, which provided that the heavens could change. So we're starting to prove this idea, that, or get away from the proof of the idea that things are perfect. Galileo then shattered the idea of heavenly perfection after he built a telescope in late 1609. Note that Galileo did not invent the telescope, which is a common misconception, but he did build one himself in 1609. Through his telescope, Galileo saw sunspots on the sun, which were considered imperfections at the time. He also used his telescope to prove that the moon had mountains and valleys, like the imperfect Earth, by noticing the shadows cast uh, near the dividing lines between the light and dark portions of the lunar surface. So you can see that here on the image on the right, near the light and dark sides of the moon, the sun is casting shadows on all the craters and valleys and stuff that are there. So the moon is not perfect, like they might have believed back then. So if the heavens were in fact not perfect, then the idea of elliptical orbits, instead of those perfect circles, was not so objectionable. It's not really far-fetched anymore. So he shattered two of those views pretty quickly. The third objection, which was the absence of the observed stellar parallax, had been of particular concern of Tycho. Based on his estimates of the distances of stars, Tycho believed that his naked eye observations were sufficiently precise to detect this parallax if Earth did in fact orbit the Sun. Refuting Tycho's, or Tycho's argument required showing that the stars were more distant than Tycho had thought, and therefore too distant for him to have observed stellar parallax. Although Galileo didn't actually prove this fact, he provided strong evidence in its favor. For example, he saw with his telescope that the Milky Way resolved into countless individual stars. This discovery helped him argue that the stars were far more numerous and more distant than Tycho had believed. So if you think about this, um, you know, if you hold your finger up directly in front of your face with one eye closed, and then you swap back and forth which eye is closed, you see your finger move back and forth even though you're not physically moving your finger. If you move your finger to being arm, an arm's length away, and you do the same thing, your finger still moves, but it moves less. Now imagine doing this for your finger if it was as far away as other stars. It's not going to look like it moves at all. So that's why this is such a big deal. This is starting to prove that all these stars aren't on some sphere around the Earth in this what we call celestial sphere. It turns out that stars are incredibly far away, and they're much further than the sun and the moon and all of that. Um, so this is something new um, to these ideas back then. In hindsight, the final nails in the coffin of the Earth-centered model came with two of Galileo's earliest discoveries through his telescope. First, he observed four moons clearly orbiting Jupiter and not Earth. His sketches, which are shown on the right, show four stars near Jupiter, which is the circle, but in different positions at different times, with one or more sometimes hidden from view. Galileo soon realized that the stars were actually moons orbiting Jupiter. <laughs> By itself, this observation still did not rule out a stationary Earth-centered solar system. However, it showed that moons can orbit a moving planet like Jupiter, which overcame some critics' complaints that the moon could not stay with a moving Earth. So now we have even more evidence for these things occurring. Soon thereafter, he observed that Venus goes through phases 
in a way that makes sense only if it orbits the sun and not earth. Now, this is a huge deal, and this is the second nail in the coffin. So here you see actual images of the phases that Venus is going through. So we can take a look at how this might work. So here is the Earth, Moon, and um, uh, the Sun. So if we took that Ptolemaic model, the Earth-centered model, where the Earth is the center of everything, and the Moon was moving around us along a smaller circle, and then the Sun was moving around us even further, well, if you look at this, we would never see the bright side of the moon in, in more than just maybe a sliver. We might see like just a tiny bit of it. Notice that the dark side of the moon is always facing us. So we would never see phases of the moon if the Earth-centered model were correct. right? But we know today that we do see an entire cycle of phases of the moon. So this can't possibly be correct. Well, look at this now. Um, so if we look at the Copernican view, so we say that the sun is the center of the solar system, and then Venus is going around the sun, and then us further away. Well, look at this. If, the, if Venus is between us and the sun, well, we'll see a, a dark side of Venus, a new phase of Venus. If it's on the opposite side of the sun, we'll see it as full. And then in between, we'll see the varying phases, just like we see with the moon. And this, you can compare with to some of the images here, perfectly matches what we see with Venus. So this idea alone pretty much put the nails in the coffin for this whole Earth-centered idea. I mean, this, this alone can explain it. Uh, so Galileo did some wonderful things for astronomy. Although we now recognize that Galileo won the day, the story was more complex in his own time. When the Catholic Church doctrine still uh, held Earth to be the center of the universe. On June 22, 1633, Galileo was brought before the Church Inquisition in Rome and was ordered to recant his claims that the Earth orbits the Sun. Nearly 70 years old and fearing for his life, Galileo did as ordered and his life was spared. However, legend has it, as he rose from his knees, he whispered under his breath, Eper si muove, Italian for and yet it moves. But given the likely consequence, if the church officials had heard him say this, most historians doubt the legend. But something interesting to think about. The church did not formally vindicate Galileo until 1992. So, you know, a couple hundred years later, oh, sorry, you were right. Uh, so, it's amazing. Uh, so, but, you know, new ideas are always threatened in the current time. All right, and finally on to our last gentleman, Newton. Um, so this guy really just completely blew away expectations and just shattered everything we thought we knew and developed many, many ideas and all these new things and gave us a complete mathematical understanding of pretty much the universe. Um, Newton, as you can tell, I get a little excited. He's probably, to me, one of the most important men that has ever lived. While Galileo's observations showed convincingly that the Ptolemaic model was entirely wrong and that a heliocentric model is the more nearly correct one, he was unable to provide a complete explanation of why Earth should orbit the Sun and not vice versa. So he had made these observations that showed that that must be it, but he couldn't explain why. The first person who was able to provide such an explanation was the Englishman Isaac Newton, born on Christmas Day of 1642, a dozen years after the death of Kepler and the same year that Galileo died. While Kepler and Galileo revolutionized our understanding of planetary motions, Newton's, contributions was, uh, Newton's contribution was far greater. He deduced the basic laws that govern all motion on Earth as well as in the heavens. Newton had a difficult childhood and showed few signs of unusual talent. He attended Trinity College at Cambridge, where he earned his keep by performing menial labor, such as cleaning the boots and bathrooms of wealthier students and waiting on their tables. The plague hit Cambridge shortly after Newton graduated, and he returned home. By his own account, he experienced a moment of inspiration in 1666, when, and when he saw an apple fall to the ground. 
He suddenly realized that the gravity making the apple fall was the same force that held the moon in orbit around the Earth. Newton's sudden insights delivered the final blow to Aristotle's view. By recognizing that gravity operates in the heavens as well as on Earth, Newton eliminated Aristotle's distinction between the two realms and brought the heavens and Earth together as one universe. This insight also heralded the birth of the modern science of astrophysics. Although the term wasn't coined until laws discovered on Earth uh, to phenomena throughout the cosmos. Um, over the next 20 years, Newton's work completely revolutionized mathematics and science. Newton quantified the laws of motion and gravity, conducted crucial experiments regarding the nature of light, built the first reflecting telescopes, and you know, no big deal, invented the mathematics of calculus. The compendium of Newton's discoveries is so tremendous that it would take a complete book just to describe them, and many, many more books to describe their influence on civilization. When Newton died, poet Alexander Pope composed the following epitaph. Nature and nature's laws lay hidden in the night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. In 1678, Newton published the Laws of Motion and Gravity in his book, uh, which translates to Mathematical Principles of Nature and Philosophy, or of Natural Philosophy, uh, typically called Principa. I actually have a version of these texts. He enumerated three laws that apply to all motion, which we now call Newton's Laws of Motion. So just like Kepler had three laws of planetary motion, Newton has three laws of motion. These laws govern the motion of everything, from our daily movements to the movements of planets, stars, and galaxies throughout the universe. Now, before we begin um, our discussion on Newton's laws, we must be sure that we are familiar with several common terms in physics. So, I took out a lot of the math that would be here, um, but it's still important to know some of these terms and to at least have a very, very basic understanding of, again, the, the most simple terms in physics, because we will use quite a bit of these throughout some of our discussions. First is speed. Speed is a measure of how fast an object is moving, and it is typically measured in meters per second. Now here in the United States, we t tend to use miles per hour, um, but that's pretty much only here in the United States. We in science use the metric system, so meters per second. Speed and velocity is often uh, confused or used interchangeably. They are measured in the same units, but the difference is that velocity also has a direction. So velocity is speed, but with a direction. So if I say I'm moving at 30 miles per hour, I gave you a speed. But if I say I am moving at 30 miles per hour to the east, well, I just gave you a velocity. Acceleration is the rate at which a velocity changes. Um, so that is measured in meters per second squared. Force. This is the push or pull that acts on an object. A force is measured in newtons. Um, sometimes you hear it as pounds, but that's more um, along with weight. Mass, which is measured in kilograms, is a measure of the total amount of material within an object. Now, much like speed and velocity are interchanged in society, mass and weight are all also often interchanged. Mass is a measure of how much material is in an object and is measured in kilograms. But weight is a force of gravity that acts on an object. So it's actually measured as a force in newtons or sometimes as pounds. So mass and weight are not the same thing. Okay, let's go and break down the three laws of Newton. Newton's first law of motion essentially restates Galileo's discovery that objects will remain in motion unless a force acts to stop them. It can be stated as follows. Newton's first law. An object moves at a constant velocity if there is no net force acting upon it, or an object remains at rest or moves in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted upon by a net outside force. In other words, objects at rest, in other words, with a velocity of zero, 
tend to remain at rest, and objects in motion tend to remain in motion, with no change in either their speed or direction. The idea that an object at rest should remain at rest is rather obvious. A car parked on a flat street won't suddenly start moving for no reason. But what if the car is traveling along a flat, straight road? Newton's first law says that the car should keep going at the same speed forever unless a force acts to slow it down. You know that the car eventually will come to a stop if you take your foot off the gas pedal. So one or more forces must be stopping the car. In this case, uh, forces are arising from friction and air resistance. So friction between, say, your tires in the road and the air resistance uh, that your car is experiencing while moving through the atmosphere. If the car were in space, and therefore unaffected by friction or air, it would keep moving forever. Newton's first law also explains why you don't feel any sensation of motion while you're, tra while you're traveling in an airplane on a smooth flight. As long as the plane is traveling at a constant velocity, no net force is acting on you. Therefore, you feel no different from the way you would feel at rest. You can walk around the cabin, play catch with someone, or relax and go to sleep just as though you were at rest on the ground. Right? That's just because if you're moving at a constant speed, there are no net forces acting on you, just like you are at rest. Newton's second law. This is our second time that we'll experience a little bit of math, but luckily we'll stick to just the simpler equations for this course. Newton's second law of motion says that in order to give an object an acceleration, that is, to change its speed or velocity, a net outside force must act on the object. So, you need something to act on the object to accelerate it. To be specific, this law says that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the net outside force acting on the object. That is, the harder you push on an object, the greater the resulting acceleration. If a net outside force, F, acts on an object of mass, M, the object will experience an acceleration um, such that F equals MA one of the most famous equations ever, maybe perhaps aside from E equals mc squared. Um, so the force F is equal to the mass of the object M times the acceleration of that object A. Notice that if you don't have an acceleration A, so if this was zero, well then you have zero force, and vice versa. So if you have no force, you will not get an acceleration. That's the basic idea behind his second law. And the acceleration caused by Earth's gravity is always 9.8 meters per second squared. It does vary very, very slightly um, from point to point on the Earth's surface, but on average it's 9.8 meters per second squared. This law explains why you can throw a baseball farther than you can throw a shot in the shot put. The force your arm delivers to both the baseball and the shot equals the product of the mass and acceleration. Because the mass of the shot put is greater than the mass of the baseball, the same force from your arm gives the shot a smaller acceleration. Because of its smaller acceleration, the shot leaves your hand with less speed than the baseball and therefore travels a shorter distance before hitting the ground. We have seen that a planet is continually accelerating as it orbits the sun. From Newton's second law, this means that there must be a net outside force that acts continually on each of the planets. Right, so we saw because of this elliptical orbit idea that the speed of the planet is always changing, which means it's always accelerating. And by this Newton's second law, if you have an acceleration, you have a force acting on that object. So there must be some force acting on these planets. And what we find out is that um, this force is the gravitational attraction of the sun. Uh, so we'll get into that a bit later. Newton's third law tells us that any force is always paired with another. To quote, whenever one object exerts a force on a second, the second object exerts an oppositely directed force of equal strength on the first. In other words, you hear this commonly as equal and opposite reactions. For example, the space shuttle is propelled upward by a force equal and opposite to the force with which gas is expelled out its back. Right, So you have gas flying downward 
so that the shuttle can move upward. This is an example of Newton's third law. Think for a moment about sitting still in your chair. Well, you know, uh, so you're watching this video, you might be sitting in a chair right now, so just imagine that. Your weight exerts a downward force. So if this force were acting alone, Newton's second law would demand that you accelerate downward, right? F equals ma. You're sitting here with mass, so you're exerting a force on your chair. So it tells, his laws tell us that we should be moving downward as a result, but we don't. The fact that you are not falling means that there must be no net force acting on you, which is only possible if the ground is also exerting an upward force on you, or your chair is exerting an upward force on you. Right? So if you're sitting down, you're exerting a force on your chair, but you're not falling down. So your chair must also be exerting a force on you, which is a very odd thing to think about. This is something we go into a lot in my physics course. Um, but your chair is exerting a force on you, otherwise you would fall through it. Uh, so it is exerting an upward force on you that precisely offsets the downward force that you exert on the chair. The fact that the downward force you exert on the chair is offset by an equal and opposite force that pushes upward on you is one example of Newton's third law of motion, which tells us that any force is always paired with an equal and opposite reaction force. All right, time for some questions. I love these ones. So, two sumo wrestlers push against each other during a match. One wrestler is much larger than the other. The larger wrestler's feet remain on the floor, while the smaller wrestler's feet slip and he is accelerated in a push right out of the ring. Compare the force that the large wrestler exerts on the smaller wrestler to the force that the smaller wrestler exerts on the larger. So it's just saying compare the two forces. Are they equal? Which one's bigger? Which one's smaller? Um, so take a moment to think about this and pause your video. All right. Well, if you ask this outside of my course here, um, almost everybody will say that the larger wrestler exerted the larger force because he was pushing the guy out of the ring. But we just learned Newton's third law. As described by Newton's third law, the forces that the two sumo wrestlers exert on each other are of equal strength but in opposite directions. This is true even though they are of different size. Right? So we always have this pairing of forces. Even though he's larger, his acceleration is much smaller, and so the forces are equal. All right, one more. Um, in midair, after stepping off a diving board, a diver is pulled down to the water by her weight. However, the diver pulls up on the earth with a force of equal strength. So why doesn't the earth move an equal amount as the diver, right? So why don't they meet halfway, necessarily, or anything like that? So take a moment to think about it and pause your video. Well, this can come from Newton's second law. So expressing Newton's second law in terms of acceleration, in other words, we take f equals ma and rewrite it, instead of f equals ma, we have a equals f over m. Since the gravitational forces on the diver and earth are of equal strength, so the force is the same for both, the one with the smaller mass, that is the diver, will have the larger acceleration. Right? So if, let's just say for example, these are obviously not real numbers, let's just say the earth has a mass of 2. Well then you're dividing your, this number by 2 uh, and you get a small acceleration. Um, but let's say the diver has a mass of 1. Well now you're only dividing by 1, so you end up getting a bigger number. So the, um, because the earth is so much more massive than the diver, Earth's acceleration, in this case, is nowhere near measurable. Um, you, there, we don't have any equipment that would be able to detect that acceleration. It is technically there, but it is so small and so minuscule that it effectively does not matter whatsoever. All right, last slide for this lecture. Newton realized that because the sun is exerting a force on each planet to keep it in orbit, each planet must also exert a force on the sun. However, the planets are much less massive than the sun. Therefore, although the forces have the same strength, the planets' smaller, smaller mass 
gives it a much larger acceleration according to Newton's second law. This is why the planets circle the sun and not vice versa. Thus, Newton's laws reveal the reason for our heliocentric system. So, not only did we make some observations now from Galileo to show that the heliocentric model is the only thing that could explain what's happening, but now Newton came along and came up with all this mathematical construct to prove and explain why these things are happening. Um, so these guys together, as we have said many times, they put the nails in the coffin and they finally gave us our heliocentric modern view of the solar system. Uh, so that's a great place to stop. Um, we are now up to speed. We learned a little bit about what happened in the past, leading us up to our modern ideas in astronomy. Um, so this is the end of our history lesson. And from here, we will start talking about what we now see today. Standing here on Earth, looking up into the heavens. What do we see? And we can describe that now. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.